Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the John F. Kennedy Junior Forum here at the Kennedy School at Harvard University. My name is David Elwood. I'm the dean here at the Kennedy School, and it's certainly my pleasure to welcome you tonight to yet another in our series of uh, very uh, thought-provoking and interesting discussions. Uh, but before I introduce tonight's speaker, I would like to just take a quick moment to recognize a tragedy that many of you will have heard of today. Uh, there was a set of sh shootings at Virginia Tech uh, campus, and more than 30 people were killed. So I would just like to observe a quick moment of silence uh, in their memory. Thank you. Our thoughts and prayers are certainly with those who suffer there and everywhere around the world. Uh, tonight, I'm very pleased to welcome Afif Safiya, who is the head of the Palestinian Liberation Organization Mission in Washington, D.C. It's a position he has held since November of 2005. But uh, Ambassador Safiya tonight is a, a remarkable man because he brings together a variety of skills that we'd like to think we can teach our own uh, students. A common, he has been a scholar, and you'll see in a moment he's uh, participated in various places, including Harvard University as a scholar. He's also been a diplomat, uh, and he's served in various settings. Um, born in Jerusalem, uh, his early education uh, was at the College de Freres. De Freres. Ah, terrible there. Um, in 1972, um, he obtained a degree in political science and international relations from the Catholic University of Louvain in Belgium. He then continued his studies at the Paris Institute of Political Studies, graduating in 1974. Indeed, he was pe president of the Belgian section of the General Union of Palestinian Students from 1969 uh, to 1971, and then president of the French branch from 74 to 75. Then from 1976 to 78, as you can see, many things, uh, he was deputy director of the Palestinian Liberation Organization Observer Mission to the United Nations. And from 78 to 81, he was a staff member on President Arafat's office in Beirut in charge of European affairs and UN institutions. In the early 1980s, he was a researcher at the Center for European Studies in the Catholic University of Louvain in Belgium. And from 1985 to 1987, he was a visiting scholar here at Harvard at the Center for International Affairs. And indeed, we were just chatting about that. And his young children, apparently, I hope I'm not taking your thunder here, uh, still have a Boston accent. I said, I didn't, didn't realize you could be scarred that quickly. Um, he then served as PLO representative uh, to the Netherlands in 1987 to 1990. And in November and December of 1988, he was involved in the Stockholm negotiations that led to the official and direct American-Palestinian dialogue. Um, he was a uh, Palestinian general delegate to the United Kingdom in 1990, um, and in 1995, he was invited to become a member of the International Board of Trustees of Bethlehem University, the Vatican-sponsored university in Palestine. Uh, nominated Palestinian general delegate to the Holy See, he presented his letter of credentials to the Pope, Pope John Paul II, on November 6, 1995. He's also the author of three books, um, Children of a Lesser God, uh, The End of Prehistory, um, and On Palestinian Diplomacy, all published by the Palestinian General Delegation of the United Kingdom. And his latest book, which may make four, uh, In Search of Palestinian Identity, was published in 2005. It, uh, please welcome me, uh, uh, please join me in welcoming uh, Ambassador <laughs> Afif Safiya. Dean Elwood, ladies and gentlemen, hi Rosie. Uh, it's a privilege for my wife and I to be with you here in Harvard. And uh, Dean Elwood, when we left London some 16, 17 months ago, there was a joke in London, very fashionable, about the difference between an ambassador and a camel. Apparently, a camel can work for 10 days without drinking, while an ambassador can drink for 10 days without work. <laughs> Let me set your heart at ease. I'm said I'm known to be closer to a camel or a moderately drinking camel. 
Ladies and gentlemen, very few Arabs and very few Americans know that the first country to recognize American independence was not France, who, yes, deployed Lafayette and his input was decisive on the battlefield, but it was an Arab country that was the first to recognize American independence, Morocco. Very few Palestinians and very few Americans know that in 1919, when our people, the Palestinian people, knew that we would be having foreign rule, that we, the Palestinians, would have preferred an American mandate rather than a British mandate, and that for three reasons. One, your anti-colonial experience. Two, Woodrow Wilson, who went to the Versailles Conference upholding the principle of self-determination. And number three, the King Crane Commission that President Woodrow Wilson sent to Palestine for a fact-finding mission and came back to report to the administration and to Congress that the Balfour Declaration cannot be implemented unless massive use of force is used against the indigenous population. I mentioned this, uh, Dean Elwood, just to say that I don't believe that there is a difference in values. Uh, we are not, we Arabs, uh, unfamiliar and uncomfortable with modernity. On the contrary, I believe we share the same principles that have become universal. The two hypotheses that I be floating in this discussion, ladies and gentlemen, are the following. It's my intimate conviction that the perpetuation of the conflict in the recent years was not due to Arab rejection of Israeli existence, but was due to Israeli rejection of Arab acceptance. The second hypothesis is to say that if we clinically study the respective position of both sides, I believe that what is acceptable to the Israelis is unacceptable to the Palestinians and vice versa. Hence, there is a need for third party role and whoever speaks of third parties today thinks of the American administration. Dean Elwood, I was advised when I crossed the Atlantic never to mention my pro-French affinities, but I will not concede from you since I'm speaking to an enlightened audience that I personally was converted to the De Gaulle approach since 67. De Gaulle, who was a statesman very familiar with the pathology of conflict and the psychology of belligerence, after 67 floated the idea which was called then la concertation à quatre, meaning the coordination of the major, major four countries. China was not yet in the Security Council. And in a way, he wanted those major powers on behalf of the international community to signal to the local belligerent parties what the world expects from them. Unfortunately, ladies and gentlemen, this idea never really took off the ground. Why? Because America in 67 was not unhappy with the Israeli military victory. It compensated the humiliations of Vietnam. The Soviets, short-sighted like they frequently could be, preferred the bipolar constellation and didn't see why they should give equal status to lesser countries like England and France. The English were unenthusiastic simply because the idea was French to begin with. And ladies and gentlemen, since then, instead of having durable peace, we are having a permanent peace process, meaning the symptom of its failure. The title suggested the triangle, the American, the Israeli, the Palestinian triangle. Let me start with the Palestinian pole. I believe we, the Palestinian dimension, we have lived 12 months which were difficult because we had two different elections, the presidential and the legislative elections that produced two different majorities. And we had what the French would call la cohabitation, meaning the presidency was in the hand of a certain political orientation, but the government and the parliament had a different majority. This is not unprecedented in history. The French have known la cohabitation. And today, sir, you have here in America a sort of form of cohabitation, since we have here now a Republican administration and a Democratic Congress. It resulted in our case in a sort of paralysis to the extent that we became a non-player. Let me share with you my analysis of what took place in the legislative elections. I believe the movement to which I belong, Fateh, went into those elections, sir, with three major handicaps we knew about. One, it was the longevity and durability in power. Fateh was in charge of the national movement since 1968 until 2005. Durability, longevity, with very little change in personnel. Yes, this creates the phenomenon of boredom. This results in a desire for change. It has an electoral price. The second burden that Fateh went into the elections with, sir, were the reality and the reputation of corruption. The reality was grave, acute, and serious. The reputation was even more devastating. This also results in the erosion of one's popularity. The third factor, 
that is rarely spoken about here in American circles is the fact that Fatah became identified with a peace process negotiations, the two-state solution. You're not unaware, ladies and gentlemen, that the last six years, the peace process was totally non-existent, and the years that preceded, the peace process was totally unconvincing, because for us Palestinians, the years of theoretical peacemaking, we witnessed not the withdrawal of occupation, but the expansion of occupation with the doubling of the size and the volume of the illegal settlements and settlers. And the fact that Israel, Sharon, withdrew unilaterally out of Gaza without really liberating Gaza, allowed the radical wing of politics to say that this was the result of their heroic resistance and couldn't allow the pragmatic school of thought to say that the withdrawal out of Gaza was one of the tangible results of the fruits and the dividends of a peace process. These were, ladies and gentlemen, the three factors we knew about, the three burdens Fatih went into the election with. But besides that, and this is why my opinion is that Fatih succeeded in defeating itself, the poor relations within Fatih, the fact that they produced two competing lists, the fact that there was an attempt to merge the two lists into one, finally choosing the least appetizing candidate, the fact that many hopeful ran as independents against the official candidates, all this resulted in the election of Hamas. Now, I am, happen to be, ladies and gentlemen, an old-fashioned Democrat, and I believe in a democracy, winners and losers have to behave gracefully. And I believe Hamas obviously won, not by a landslide, it was only 44%, but they were the obvious winners. To my, it was a very disturbing phenomenon to see that the, all the comments then were of a delirious nature. Everybody started saying, the election of Hamas is a blow to the peace process. Which peace process? On the contrary, a serious analysis would have said maybe the absence of a credible diplomatic avenue was one of the factors that led to the victory of Hamas. Dean Elwood, number two, in the study of international relations, there is a school of thought that says that hawks are better equipped to be peacemakers. Only a Nixon could make the overtures towards China. Only a Begin could conclude peace with Sadat. Only a Sharon could withdraw out of Gaza. And I wonder why the partisans and the adepts of those school of thought never thought of continuing the extrapolation by saying maybe Hamas would be capable of concluding a peace that would be acceptable and binding. Anyway, ladies and gentlemen, we had a difficult 12 years month period, even there was talk of a possibility of a civil war. But luckily, no, there were talks in Mecca, and today we have a national coalition government that has my total full support. And today we have a government, ladies and gentlemen, that represents 95% of the Palestinian electorate. Had I been an Israeli, I would be happy by that, because it means any peace is concluded with that government will be sticking with immense popular acceptance. What happened in Mecca, ladies and gentlemen? I believe, one, Hamas accepted that those who negotiate on behalf of the Palestinian people are the PLO. Two, they accepted that the Palestinian Authority as a political system, uh, the conduct of foreign affairs is the prerogative of the president. Again, the same Mahmoud Abbas was the president of both the PLO and the PA. We chose an independent, distinguished personality as foreign minister. He enjoys the confidence of Hamas, but is a political friend of Abu Mazen, which means that tomorrow the presidency and the government will be working in harmony and not on a collision course. Hamas accepted to honor all resolutions uh, endorsed in the peace process, accepted and endorsed all the resolution of Arab summit meeting, and accepted to offer the Israelis with us a possible reciprocal ceasefire. So, sir, I believe today the situation in the Palestinian poll has tremendously improved, and today we, the Palestinians, are ready for peace now, and that peace will be enjoying massive popular support. Unfortunately, on the Israeli side, and I'll be telegraphic here, you're not unaware that the popularity ratings of Olmert are somewhere between two to three percent, and that unfortunately today, the leadership in Israel neither belongs to the heroic era of the War of Independence, nor do the senior minister, ministers enjoy a very impressive security military CV. So we have a problem there about the fragility 
of the Israeli political establishment, fragilized even further by the blunders of the conflagration in Lebanon. Here we come, ladies and gentlemen, to my second point at the beginning of my introduction when I said, clinically speaking, there is a need for a third party intervention. And I, for one, am hopeful that tomorrow, American diplomacy will be assertive and decisive in achieving the peace that we all know the contours of, by the way. There is no more any need for brilliant, innovative diplomatic endeavors. We all know the content and the contours of the desirable possible peace. I, for one, say the following. Today, we live in a unipolar international system after the collapse of the Soviet Union. And I, for one, believe that in a unipolar international system, non-alignment should be the foreign policy adopted by the remaining superpower. And I believe there, is many, there are many factors that advocate why non-alignment should be what characterizes American foreign policy. America, sir, is a fascinating society. You are a nation of nations, la preuve, the composition of this room. I believe America is a fascinating society. It's a nation of nations. And when America aligns itself on one belligerent player in a regional conflict, not only does it antagonize all the other players in the regional game, but it also antagonizes, offends, and alienates, and even ghettoizes a domestic component of its own national social fabric. Believe you me, ladies and gentlemen, it was not easy to be a Palestinian American, and there are 400,000 of those. It was not easy during the last 60 years to be an Arab American, and there are 4 million of those. Nor was it easy to be a Muslim American, and there are 8 million of those. And I believe that non-alignment, even-handedness, should be what characterizes American foreign policy. And I, for one, believe that today there is a need, an urgent need, to re-evaluate the architecture of relations between America and the Arab world, but also we should have the audacity of saying we need to revisit the nature of American-Israeli relations. It has been said that Israel is the only friend America has in the Middle East, but before Israel you had no enemies. And this has to be thought and discussed and said quietly, calmly. Number two, ladies and gentlemen, we have understood the message that America is committed to Israel's existence. We understood the message. But is America committed to Israel's expansion? I don't think so. And I believe there is a great increasing body of scholars and commentators on Middle Eastern realities that know today that what has poisoned international relations throughout, throughout the last decades was the unresolved nature of the Palestinian problem. And that what has put America on a collision course with much of the Arab world with the Muslim world has been the perception of American alignment on the Israeli preference constantly. So, sir, I will end my remarks by saying that I re-invite you to re have a new look at the regional diplomatic history. I believe the perpetuation of the conflict throughout the last years was not because of Arab rejection of Israeli existence, but because of Israeli rejection of Arab acceptance. And I believe that America should play this indispensable role even-handedly. To end, sir, I would say the following. I, for one, have, even in the gloomiest of moments, always believed that Palestine will resurrect. And as you know, sir, we have had in Jerusalem some previous experience in resurrection. And I, who have many Jewish and Israeli interlocutors, have often said and repeated that what was occupied in 1967 in six days can also be evacuated in six days so that the Israelis can rest on the seventh and we can engage in this fascinating journey of nation building and economic recovery. Sir, I hope I stuck to the time allocated. Thank you. All right, as is our custom, we now have time for questions. There are four microphones located around the uh, uh, floor here. There's one right here, a second one right up there, a third one over here, and a fourth one here. 
And the, uh, those of you that have been here before have heard me say this many times, but uh, uh, questions at the, in the forum have several very important characteristics, some of which I will try and enforce. The first is uh, they start with quickly identifying who you are. The second is they are short. The third is they consist of one and only one. And finally, they end with a question mark. Uh, <laughs> With those um, uh, minor stipulations, let me begin and start right over here. Hello, Mr. Ambassador. My name is Uri Leventer. I'm a student here from Israel. Thank you for your talk. And my friends here know that I am a person who wants peace. And I have uh, the few Palestinian students in the school are my, are my friends. And I believe that if me and you will sit down right now, we can agree about many, many points. But um, since many of my friends here um, who are not from the region, this is one of the first times they're hearing about this conflict in, in such details, um, I would like to have your comments about, about three, three short questions, points. <laughs> yeah, sure. One, one um, you, you explained why Fatah lost in the elections. I would like you to comment on the, another reason, which is uh, blamed that Fatah government was corrupt and uh, this... this um, this so this was my second factor, by the way. Okay. I said the reality and the reputation of corruption. So I mentioned it. Okay. Um, two I'm more. helping you. You're left with two points. Okay. Only, one more. <laughs> Only one too many. Okay. It, 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 it's one very simple point. You said we on the Palestinian side are ready for peace now. Um, some rockets are being fired in Israel, um, sometimes on a daily basis, sometimes once or twice a week. Um, and Hamas, who is a dominant part of the government, still doesn't agree to uh, recognize Israel, to denounce terrorism, and to accept former decisions on peace process. This is why the United States doesn't recognize this government. So let me come back to the issue of corruption, which I have mentioned in my initial expose, but I want to tell you one thing. I believe that corruption, unfortunately, is the most democratically shared vice across boundaries. <laughs> and you come from Israel, and I'm happy that I have an Israeli interlocutor again. Because I would like to remind you, sir, that uh, I will be merciful about Sharon. He's struggling for his life in, in hospital, but you remember the issue of the casino in the island. You remember that Netanyahu, when he was disavowed by the electorate, apparently he helped himself to the tableaus that were decorating his office and took them back home. I will not mention that Olmert has his own problems. I'll go even earlier when you were not maybe born, 73. I was lucid then. In 73, sir, Many of us remember when, in, during the first days of the battles, the Barlev fortifications collapsed within 24 hours, and labor was in power, the good guys, the adorable guys. There was a joke in Israel. After the collapse of the Barlev fortification, what remains? And the answer was the villas that were built in the suburbs of Tel Aviv. So corruption, sir, is a very shared vice across boundaries. And I don't think it was one of the impediments or obstacles to peacemaking. I'm anti-corruption. Sarah can vouch for my integrity. Sorry, if Sarah, to inter <laughs> But you're such an ethical or moral authority in the debate. So corruption. Concerning now the Qassam rockets, which I totally regret. By the way, sir, I am known for years, but I'm an outside phenomenon, that I have been in favor of the Palestinian national movement converting to nonviolent struggle. And I say that not because I want to project an image that I'm more angelic than I really am. I can be angelic, but it's not because. On a pragmatic level, I believe, like Faisal Husseini before me, that if I want to defy Mike Tyson during his glorious days, I better not invite him to the boxing ring. So I am not for angelic purposes only, but for pragmatic Machiavellian purposes, I'm in favor of nonviolence. But let me tell you, sir, when the elections took place last year, 2006, I read Haaretz every day on the internet, and I remember that all the reports of the Israeli intelligence community used to say that most Palestinians are respectful to the Palestinian unilaterally proclaimed ceasefire, and that Hamas was the most disciplined in abiding to the unilateral Palestinian ceasefire, even better than my friends who are in the orbit of Fatah. So now let me tell you why they are still those silly, by the way, rockets. Israel is reluctant, Olmert is reluctant, to extend the agreement of ceasefire to the West Bank because over there he is escalating the policy of assassination of targeted and untargeted killing and arrests. And we have kept telling him, if you want the, the ceasefire to hold in Gaza, 
you have to extend it to the West Bank because that's a casus belli. You cannot make a ceasefire in Gaza as though we are not two separate political entities. So to hold in Gaza, the ceasefire, my friend, has to extend also to the West Bank. We are in favor, Hamas is in favor, Olmert isn't. And the army on which apparently Olmert doesn't have always total control, do not want it. Now let me tell you about a moral issue, and I hope we see eye to eye on that one. First of all, to set your heart at ease, I have condemned every single suicide bombing. So I am, I am in total agreement with my conscience. But each time I have a Jewish interlocutor or an Israeli interlocutor, I tell them the following. Whoever does not condemn Israeli military incursions, Israeli military indiscriminate bombardments, Israeli targeted and untargeted killings, is not morally qualified to have an opinion on suicide bombings. <laughs> Sir, I, I, I am usually a difficult interlocutor because I'm totally a universalist. Years ago, I abandoned any tribalistic inclination one might have. So on the basis of universal principles, and I'm happy that the audience reacted the way it did. I believe any victim from now on should be seen as one victim too many. And you and I should agree that we are not children of a lesser God. Our victims, our tears, our blood does count also. Many around the world, and mainly here in America, because the intellectual debate is so imbalanced, up to now, Israeli victims do count more than Palestinian victims. And as I told you, I personally believe that those who do not condemn Israeli misbehavior, and you, have, you and I have to remember, it's Israel that occupies Palestine, not Palestine that occupies Israel, are not morally qualified to have a respectable opinion. Right up here. Hi, my name is John Gould. I'm a freshman at the college. First off, thank you for being here today. Um, it struck me when you were talking about Hamas and the unity government wanting peace that the word terrorism didn't come out throughout your entire talk. So I guess my question has two parts. One, Hamas has not yet, two parts, one question. Um, Hamas has not yet renounced terrorism. Um, and in your mind, do you believe that that's a necessary step for peace? And number two, with your eye to the camera, would you be willing to say right now that Hamas should renounce all forms of terror? Sir, first of all, it's obvious that I belong to the secular wing of Palestinian politics, and I happen to be a sociological Christian. I say sociological Christian because theologically sometimes I have doubts, but also doubts about my doubts. So, <laughs> so very obviously, I don't have any ideological affinities with Hamas. But as I told you, I'm a Democrat, and Hamas are part of the Palestinian people, and electorally, democratically, they came out with 44% of the electorate. Let me first of all tell you that Hamas should not be seen as a monster and a monolithic movement. There is no political party on earth, including political parties in this country that are monolithic. So within Hamas, sir, there are different schools of thought, and I believe there is a strong, pragmatic, modernist uh, school of thought within Hamas. So Hamas should not be seen as a monolithic. Let me, sir, give you an opinion on, of that nature. A week before our legislative elections, the number two on the Hamas list, Sheikh Abu Tair, was interviewed by Haaretz. And he said three points which I found of interest. Point number one, he said, the fact that in our electoral program there is no total liberation of Palestine, this should not be seen as a tactical maneuver but as a strategic shift. Point number two that he said in that interview a week before elections, he said, if we are elected, we, might, we will continue negotiations and might negotiate even better than our predecessors. Point number three, he said, when we speak of resistance after elections, it does not necessarily mean armed resistance. You know what happened the next day? The Israeli military forces went into his house and arrested him for a whole week until after the elections. I believe that this person, who was not exiled to Siberia by Hamas because he made that statement, I believe that statement of his reflected a school of thought, a powerful school of thought within Hamas. And that school of thought, in my opinion, prevailed in Mecca. But now if our national unity government that has been functioning for the last month if we do not succeed to make a breakthrough and bring our society out of the political quarantine in which we were relegated, the other school of thought within Hamas will 
again re-emerge and will say we were 100% of the government, we sacrificed 50% of the government because of the coalition politics, and yet that coalition government did not get us out of our political ghetto and isolation. Let's break the coalition government and come back to 100% Hamas government. This is why I'm telling you, today we have a window of opportunity that I invite the world to explore and to exploit. One other point, uh, sir. I personally believe that we need to make this coalition government succeed because it will have an impact on the future orientation of political Islam, not only in Palestine, not only in the Arab world, but from Nigeria to Malaysia. You're not without knowing. There will always be political Islam in our part of the world. It's the emanation of part of the political culture of the region. And political Islam has several temptations. Al-Qaeda and bin Laden is one. But there is also the Turkish model of constitutional pluralism, etc. The success, sir, of our coalition government today will have beneficial reverberations and repercussions on the future orientations of political Islam, not only locally, but regionally and globally, sir. And I, who has nothing to do with political Islam, would wish that school of thought to prevail and not it's not in the interest of the Palestinian people. It's also in, in the interest of the Jews in Palestine, the Jews in Israel, those who chose to be our neighbors. So I would look at it favorably and will stop repeating the same, the same slogans again and again. Now concerning international relations, sir, I'm not saying anything novel. International relations are not made by political parties. They are made by elected presidents and elected governments. The government of Palestine today, the one that obtained confidence from our elected parliament, is a government that says that it is ready to respect previous commitments taken in the peace process and has endorsed the Saudi peace plan that became the Arab peace plan. And if I were an Israeli, sir, having been brought up saying that all we want, all we yearn for is to be recognized and have normal relations with our environment. Today, sir, the message coming to you in Israel from the Arab world, from Morocco to Muscat in Oman is the following. If you, Israel, withdraw out of the 67 expansion, we, the Arabs, from Morocco to Muscat in Oman, we are ready to recognize you in your pre-67 existence. This is why, sir, I want you to reflect and to ponder on my last sentence. I have condemned every terrorist operation against civilians, sir, but very frankly, it was not terrorism that was the obstacle to peacemaking, it was territory. It was the Israeli territorial appetite that was the impediment to progress in the peace process. And as I told you, the Arabs from Morocco to Muscat are saying if Israel withdraws out of the expansion of 67, we are ready to recognize it in its pre-67 existence. Think this hypothesis. It's the territory and the territorial dimension and the territorial appetite that was the obstacle to peacemaking. Right up here. Uh, my name is Rami Saraf. I'm a senior at the college. Thank you again for uh, speaking here today. Uh, my question is about um, something that's not often talked about with respect to the conflict, and those are the Palestinian citizens who live within Israeli borders, or Arab Israelis, as some may call them, and sort of what their contribution to a future status negotiation would be. Um, furthermore, with respect to what their role could be in any sort of peace process and where their sort of uh, future fate lies, how does the reframing of the conflict in the context of apartheid and in the context of um, you know, discrimination in recent um, years impact sort of the dialogue? First of all, sir, thank you for your question. You're not without knowing 17 to 20 percent of Israeli re uh, citizens are Palestinians and Arabs. And they are, we, we Palestinians, uh, we believe the following. Israel was supposed to be the answer to the, what was called the Jewish question. Today, we, the Palestinians, are the question awaiting an answer. And I believe within Israel, you have somewhere between 17 and 20% who are citizens and residents in pre-67 Israel. 
Israel, I believe, is a democracy for its Jewish component. The status of its Palestinian residents and citizens leaves much to be desired. And I invite you, ladies and gentlemen, to follow what is going to be happening to Azmi Pshara, the most prominent politician intellectual from the Palestinian community from Israel. He's on the verge of making a dramatic decision of either resigning his Knesset seat or even abdicating his right to come back to his homeland because the security services are compiling a dossier incriminating him of treason and more than that. And I believe the Israelis will be very poorly inspired if they were to reduce and to push Azmi into either abdicating his seat in parliament or abdicating his citizenship because the one million something Palestinians in Israel will receive this as a warning uh, that the state and the society looks at them as a demographic threat, as a geographic threat, and as a fifth column, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, that component of our society within Israel is extremely important, and I, for one, believe also that we will always have a big Palestinian diaspora abroad around the world, whatever the solution in the future is. And I believe we should devise policies of Palestinian, Palestinian, Palestinian cooperation, meaning the Palestinians of the emerging Palestinian entity cooperating with the Palestinian Israelis and the Palestinian diaspora. And uh, we have still to devise such a policy beyond the slogan. And I believe, sir, that we have become today a global tribe. There are many tribes in, in the international system. The Jews are the tribe par excellence, the Armenians are a tribe, but also the Scots, the Irish, and the Indians, and the Chinese, but also we, the Palestinians, who became the Jews of the Israelis. And I believe, sir, the fact that we are dis dispersed globally, the fact that you encounter Palestinians from uh, Scandinavia to Pennsylvania to California to Australia, that's the symptom of our tragedy, catastrophe, but it's also a future source of empowerment. And I believe Palestinian communities are integrating fast in those countries of adoption and will be extremely useful for tomorrow's rebirth of our national identity and of our national sovereignty. Let me give you en passant quickly two examples. In Salvador, four years ago, there, was presidential election, there were presidential elections. Well, the candidate of the left was a Salvadorian of Bethlehem, Palestinian origin, the Hamdal family. The candidate of the right was a Palestinian from Palestine, from, from Bethlehem, from the Saqqa family. And I used to joke by saying, whoever loses, there will be a Palestinian in the local White House of San, San Salvador. And today, uh, Mr. Saqqa, Palestinian from Bethlehem, is uh, in Belize, that other microstate somewhere in Central America, there is a Palestinian. There is a Palestinian who's the prime minister from El Bire, and at moments he had a foreign minister who was from Beit Hanina, from the Schumann family. So I believe there is a gradual process of Palestinian integration in the country of adoption, and all this is helping us in our gradual empowerment in a very constructive manner. Now the Palestinians of uh, within Israel. Really, I hope that the Israeli government and the Israeli establishment will not be unwise in dealing with the Azmi Pshara phenomenon. I, on certain points, disagree philosophically, theoretically, ideologically with Azmi Pshara, but I have to tell you, from within the Palestinians of Israel, he's the most important politician, intellectual, and any repression against him uh, will be badly perceived by 20% of the society, and we don't need that additional problem inflamed. Right here. Thank you very much. Sir Ambassador, it's a pleasure to have you here. My name is Mohammed Dashan. I'm a second year student at the Kennedy School. And my question pertains to the erosion of the Palestinian position over the past 60 years or so. Not long ago, the position was, we want all of Palestine. Then it was, well, we want what Resolution 181 of 1947 said. Then it became resolution, the Resolution 1967, et cetera, et cetera which is eroding every day. We talk about 100%, 98%, 96%, and lesser than that. And now we're agreeing on, agreeing on a framework to agree on something. So my question is, why is this erosion happening? Because every time there is some sort of concession that happens in a negotiation that 
does not deliver eventually. Do you think that that's how I see it? Do you think that the Palestinian negotiators are somewhat coerced into taking that concession as the beginning point of the further negotiation, and that by the counterpart and the mediator? So how do you, why do you think this is happening, and how do we stop this erosion from taking place? Uh, first of all, sir, I agree with you that we have diminished our level of expectations, but I, uh, I believe since we adopted the two-state solution along the 67 boundaries, there is no more, for, no more room for additional elasticity. The only elasticity is that if there is a territorial swap of mutually accepted of equal quality and quantity. But yes, I agree with you. For example, 1973, the October War, Ramadan War, Kippur War was a demarcation line. From then onwards, we made distinction between what was desirable, what was possible, what was acceptable, and we diminished our level of expectations. And since then, I say, Dean Elwood, that we have become unreasonably reasonable. I believe, sir, that there is no room for more elasticity. It should be the 67 boundaries with some territorial swaps of equal quality and quantity. You spoke of the erosion of our position. Yes, if you take the balance of power only through the military dimension. On the military dimension, sir, uh, we, we are a negligible factor. Uh, but on all other dimensions, I believe there has been erosion on the Israeli side. There has been an erosion in the sympathy of Jewish communities and brought vis-a-vis -vis the official Israeli position. There has been an erosion in Western European uh, perceptions of the importance of Israel and the wisdom sagacity of Israeli policies and criticism from Europe has become very frequent and constant because they see how damaging it is for regional relations. I believe the situation is promising here on the American arena. I believe APEC has suffered some erosion of its respectability, etc. I believe it is in decreasingly representative of Jewish American preferences. I'm sure they do not reflect Professor Herbert Kelman's preferences in the region, APAC. APAC is today being challenged by three very respected, respectable Jewish American institutions, and 70% of American Jews would be in favor of the two-state solution the way we see it, and not necessarily the way Olmert and Kadima see it. So erosion on the military level, yes. The Arab world has been uh, increasingly becoming marginalized in the international equation. The Arab world today, I often describe it as a regional grouping for whom there is no advantage of befriending them and there is no risk taken in antagonizing them. They become what the French would call quantité négligeable, unless they re-emerge after the last summit in Saudi Arabia. But as I told you, look at the factors of erosion within the power structure of the Israeli position. Here, too, I see erosion, sir. The most interesting intellectual debates taking place today are Jewish-Jewish debates about the future of Israel and what Israel means and what Israel shouldn't be, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. You should read Sarah Roy's last article, A Jewish Plea where she speaks of the torments that Jewish intellectuals are undergoing because of Israeli behavior or misbehavior. If a profound, sophisticated, of high-level standards debate within Jewish circles. So there is erosion there, too. And I always invite people not to see the balance of power only in military terms. And then I can guarantee to you that there will be no further elasticity of concessions beyond the ones that have already been offered. Right over here. Uh, yes, hi, how are you? Uh, thank you for your uh, talk today. It's been very enlightening. And I wanted to just touch on the point uh, when you mentioned you're a Democrat. Um, your, your name? Just my name, you. yes. Sorry, I'd already introduced myself. My name is Tofik Rahim. I'm a master's in public policy student here at the Kennedy School, hopefully graduating next year. Um, I wanted to ask you about uh, the notion of yourself being a Democrat and democracy in the Palestinian territories and beyond uh, within the Palestinian community. It seems to me that uh, democracy, uh, preference of democracy is an expedient option, both in this country and within the territories. When President Arafat was in power, there was a movement here uh, and within many uh, circles in Fatah to devolve uh, powers to a prime minister. But then when Hamas wins the election, there's this movement to consolidate power within the presidency. Um, furthermore, 
uh, you talked about the acceptance of the PLO as the negotiator uh, for the Palestinians. And my question to you is, what about democracy within the PLO? What makes that static institution the democratic representative of Palestinians, including refugees who do not live in the occupied territories? First of all, uh, I'm not the only one who agrees with you that the PLO is in poor shape and needs to be reinvigorated, updated, re revitalized. And uh, so everybody now, there is a committee that is convening in Damascus, which might not be the ideal capital for th rethinking the PLO and its future. <laughs> but uh, a, a follow-up meeting will continue in Cairo, which will be the decision-making forum there. So updating, uh, reinvigorating, reawakening the dormant PLO is on the agenda, and I agree with that. Uh, number two, sir, yes, I remember when in 2003 there were attempts to reduce the prerogatives of the president and create a prime minister's position. I, for one, happen to be a goalist not only in international affairs but on constitutional levels. I'm a presidentialist, which I believe is a very democratic system, and I had tears in my eyes when I attended the session of our parliament and I saw them take the vote of 32 against 22 to move from what I call the Fifth Republic back to the Fourth Republic. Instead of moving forward, we're moving backwards. Uh, concerning our democracy and elections, I always say democracy is our expectation, our aspiration, our right, and even our duty. And the way some reacted to the results of our democracy made me say that we want democracy, but others might want docility or destabilization. This is why I invite everybody to be coherent and consistent with one's belief. If you believe in democracy, you have to accept the result of that democratic consultation. I am in favor today of the coalition government, of the political partnership between Fatah and Hamas, but this does not mean that in the next election I wouldn't want the secular school of thought to become again the senior partner and the other school the junior partner. Yet I want to be a truthful, faithful partner in that coalition government. So, sir, uh, I am in favor of presidential systems, by the way. I believe that uh, de Gaulle was accused of being uh, guilty of what was called then by Giscard d'Estaing, l'exercice solitaire du pouvoir, the solitary exercise of power. On the contrary, when he was disavowed on a marginal issue on a referendum, he withdrew with great grandeur. Yep. So today, sir, Hamas is committed to what I said that it's the PLO that negotiates today and even better tomorrow after we would have revitalized it. But already today, they accept that the PLO negotiates on behalf of the Palestinian people, and the PA is only part of the PLO. The PLO is much bigger than the PA. Sorry, the refugees have a right to vote in the PLO? Sir, there is always a problem of uh, voting in neighboring countries. Uh, when I was in London, and I spent 15 years in London, if I was asked to organize a superbly well choreographed and managed election for the Palestinian who happened to reside in Britain, I could have organized a glasnostically transparent exercise. Probably a thousand would have taken part in that election. But what's the case of the three million Palestinians of Jordan, the 600,000 in Syria, and the 350,000 in Lebanon? I believe there will be governmental interference, and that's the bulk. They are, I'm speaking now of over four million Palestinians. Uh, I, I don't see, sir, a democratic consultation possible in the diaspora communities in the immediate vicinity on the periphery of Palestine. So we can organize a fantastic, impeccable election for the 1,000 in Britain, but the 4 million, it's extremely difficult. This is why in Palestinian politics, we found mechanism to bypass that. You take the union of engineers. The union of engineers in Jordan are mainly of Palestinian engineers. So you might ask that, the, you might decide that the entire executive committee are ipso facto members of the Palestinian National Council, the union of lawyers. 50% of them might be of Palestinian origin. You might say the Palestinians of the board, executive board of the union of lawyers in Jordan, they would have great legitimacy. Yes, they would have been elected as members of the board of the lawyers union, 
not for the Palestinian National Council, but they have legitimacy and representativity. You have to find alternative formulas. Or else, my friend, the, the 30 you would like to see elected from Syria will all, all be pro-Syrian regime and not making choices within the Palestinian domestic debate. Right up here. Yes, hello, my name is uh, Aaron Goldstein. Uh, sir, you have argued here and in other fora that the perpetuation of the Arab-Israeli conflict is due not to Arab rejection of Israeli existence, but to the Israeli rejection of Arab acceptance. Yet Saudi Arabia and the Arab League still boycott Israel. Syria provides sanctuary to Hezbollah to fire rockets into northern Israel. And Israel is not even included on maps of the Middle East in Palestinian textbooks. So what is this Arab acceptance of Israel which you fondly speak? So the way I summarized it, sir, in 2002 already there was a Abdullah, he was then crown prince, a Abdullah Saudi initiative that enjoyed Palestinian blessings that became the Arab peace initiative in the summit of Beirut 2002. By the way, it wasn't very different from the Fahed plan of 1982, which was adopted uh, by the Arab summit meeting in Fez, Morocco. And always it speaks of Israeli withdrawal out of the 67 expansion and Arab recognition of Israel and normalization of relations. It's that part that is never being delivered, sir. And let me tell you, if I were an Israeli, sir, I would know the following that peace and security comes not from territorial aggrandizement, but from regional acceptance. And if I were an Israeli, I would have understood that we, the Palestinians, are the key for the regional acceptance of Israel. When the peace process was moving smoothly with us, doors were opening from Morocco to Muscat. When the peace process became rough and tough with us, those same doors were closing up. So today, sir, Olmer thinks he's smart when he says, oh, the Saudi initiative, it might be interesting. I need to sit down with you and talk about it. The Saudi initiative, its point is the following. Normalization with the Arab countries will follow Israeli withdrawal. So the Israelis need to sit with us and withdraw out of Palestinian and Syrian occupied territory. As a result of that, the Arabs will establish diplomatic relations and normalize relations. It's a reward for Israeli good behavior and not a prerequisite or an inducement for Israeli. So it's a reward and a reducement, uh, inducement, but it's a reward that should follow Israeli compliance with the prerequisites of the peace process, my friend. And the peace process was established in 91 Madrid on two pillars, land in exchange for peace. And I am in favor of 100% peace. So the territorial dimension, sir, again. And believe you me, Arab public opinion also would like to have his, the conflict behind us. So not only in Israel, I can feel that there is a sort of feeling temperature within public opinion that they would like to get rid of this endless conflict, but also in the Arab world, because everything in the Arab world has been frozen en attendant that we solve the Israeli-Palestinian problem. So let's solve it. So I'm not in favor of peace tomorrow. We are in favor of peace now and forever. Right up here. Thank you very much for coming today. I'm Will Rubin, a freshman at the college. Um, you say that with the new Palestinian governing coalition, there's a window of opportunity um, for an agreement. And you recognize uh, the necessity of a third party mediator uh, to arrive at this agreement. What specific, what specific and realistic uh, recommendations would you have to the Bush administration and other potential third party mediators to attain peace during this window of opportunity? So first of all, let me give you the definition given to diplomacy in the Middle East by a very prestigious enlightened Zionist leader called Nahum Goldman, who was for 40 years the leader of the World Zionist Organization commenting critically on Kissinger's shuttle diplomacy of 73-74, he said, it seems to me that diplomacy in the Middle East is the art of delaying the inevitable as long as possible. Remember, the art of delaying the, and the inevitable already for him in 73 was the Palestinian state to be born. Up to today, sir, this definition remains valid. 
diplomacy is the art of delaying the inevitable as long as possible. And I call the diplomacy we are watching, those multiplicity of visits, agitation with no progress, static diplomacy, which is far from being aesthetic. What is needed? Goldman, again, Goldman used to joke by speaking to uh, Moshe Dayan 30 years ago and used to tell him, the Americans, my friend, give you a lot of aid and some advice. Up to now, you take all the aid and you leave the advice aside. What will happen if ever the Americans were to tell you you can have the aid only if you also took the advice? So my friend, my first recommendation is that the American administration has to have the political audacity of linking the aid to the advice. The way it was done in 91 by Bush father and James Baker, who told the Israelis, we invite you for peacemaking in Madrid. You don't have a choice. You have to come. We're expecting you. And since you're interested in having the loan, 10 billion loan guarantee to help you absorb the 1 million returning Russian Jews and Russian non-Jews, because 40% of them were not even Jews, we will give you the loan guarantee if you freeze settlement ex expansion. So we need an American administration, sir, that has the political audacity of linking aid and advice and behave towards the Israelis as though it is the representative of American society, the only remaining superpower, and not as though it was Liechtenstein or Luxembourg. Up to now, the American administration deals with Israel as though their representatives were Liechtenstein and Luxembourg. Uh, as I told you, sir, the American role is decisive and indispensable. Uh, Eisenhower, in 56, 57, with a phone call, he had Ben Gurion withdraw out of the occupied Sinai as a result of the Suez Canal War. A phone call. And then he didn't have as an incentive Arab collective recognition of Israel. He just, with a phone call, had Ben Gurion withdraw. And believe you me, uh, Sharon and Olmert, uh, compared to Ben-Gurion, look like a lamb. Uh, Ben-Gurion was known to be the roaring lion, etc. A phone call. So I'm waiting for one day a phone call. <laughs> phone call. Israel's existence is no more being challenged. It's Israel expansion that is being questioned. In Israel, our friends in Israel are having a discussion about the wisdom of keeping the hilltops of the West Bank. What is America's interest in Israel keeping the hilltops of the West Bank? Is it worth antagonizing the entire world? Is it wor worth it to tarnish your credibility and your respectability around the world because you are complacent, indulgent, too much understanding vis-a-vis -vis Israeli territorial appetite when the Israelis themselves are questioning the wisdom of keeping the occupied territories. Why should America shield Israel from the UN, UN, in the UN and elsewhere? Why? Why should you say Israel is our only friend in the Middle East when all of us offer you friendship? I, for example, as a person, yes, I might be Francophile, but I was brought up, <laughs> yes, but uh, part of your American culture is also of French origin. Uh, French is still spoken in Louisiana. I, for one, I told you, I love American society, and I'm not saying it to please you. I grew up watching every day a, a Hollywood film. I'm, I'm, by the way, an authority, more maybe than on diplomacy, on Hollywood history, from the silent period to the black and white to, it, to Technicolor and all the rest. I can speak with great expertise from Greta Garbo, too. So, Today I was reading, and I don't know which paper, how Arab students like going to American universities, either here in America or the American universities that are being opened all over the Arab world. We have no problem with you except foreign policy in the Middle East. Yes, yes. And as I told you, always remember, the Israelis are discussing whether they should keep the hilltops of the West Bank. So, and often it's becoming a cliche now. There is a much more interesting and sophisticated debate about projections into predictable, desirable futures in the Knesset than there is on Capitol Hill. So the one who coined this sentence that Capitol Hill is another Israeli-occupied territory that needs one day to be liberated, if ever we are to, uh, it's not a demagogic, Judgment, it's a very accurate judgment. I've seen legislators in America 
And whenever you have elections, I've seen American politicians campaigning more in Tel Aviv than in Tennessee, more in Jerusalem than in Georgia, more in Beersheba than in Boston. Uh, it's time that you tell them, hey, come back over here. The debate is here, not over there. And I've seen politicians who are running for elections because of fundraising needs and otherwise they read the script that APAC expects from them. And uh, I've seen recently a presidential candidate for whom I have great affinity, by the way. And when he read what was expected from him, there was also attacks by saying, yes, he read all, he said all the right things, but not with the usual passion to which he accustomed us. So uh, uh, there, yani I'm in favor of an Arab awakening, but maybe there should be also an American awakening on certain issues. Maybe I said too much on that issue. <laughs> I'm afraid we have time for just two more questions. First one will be there. Thank you very much, sir, for coming. My name is Eli Overstern. I'm an Israeli student here at the Kennedy School. It's a pleasure. Uh, our, our pleasure as well to exchange views here. Um, I think, uh, as you rightly said, there is a very vigorous debate within Israel as to how to achieve peace and security. The vast majority of Israelis do want peace. The vast majority of Israelis are willing to make very painful concessions in Israeli eyes to achieve that peace. I think what scares most Israelis is the lack of ability uh, of the Palestinian government to achieve security, both for Palestinians and for Israelis. Uh, Arafat's regime track record was that of failing to stop terrorism attacks from being launched on a massive scale against Israel, uh, although he too denounced terrorism rhetorically. Uh, can you give Israelis and the world any assurances, any credible assurances that the Palestinian partner will indeed live up and deliver on security? You said that even Hamas, even Fatah factions are not really loyal and disciplined to Fatah. Let me tell you, sir, uh, thank you for your intervention. And uh, I always say, by the way, to Israeli um, uh, interlocutors that we are destined or condemned to be uh, neighbors and to live side by side. And uh, both of us might have preferred to have the Norwegians as our immediate neighbors, but that, that scenario is not on offer. So we have to discuss in the most civilized manner the future models of our cohabitation. And I understand that security is one of those important dimensions that need to be tackled. Sir, so I, for one, believe that when Fatih and Hamas agree on something, their capacity of ensuring, and I prefer the word ensuring rather than enforcing, but it comes out to be the same. Their capacity of ensuring disciplined abidance by everybody else is extremely high. Today, sir, Fatah and Hamas are in favor of comprehensive ceasefire with the Israelis in Gaza and the West Bank. As I said earlier, the fact that it is not being extended to the West Bank is making the ceasefire in Gaza precarious, perilous, and collapse. I would work on that basis, sir. And the absence of context, for example, today the Israeli reaction to our unity government was to boycott the entire government, the Hamas components, but also the non-Hamas components, which I believe was a very unwise attitude. We can deliver on security. And I personally believe the government in Israel will be well advised to deal and to negotiate and to dialogue with the Palestinians. We both agree, probably, that there are certain points, if ever they are achieved, will improve the environment. What are those points? An agreement on the release of the soldier, uh, Shalit, which should be within the framework of a package. Uh, I think if it happens, and it should happen, and very soon, it will create a more positive or a less negative environment. Today, by the way, my office circulated an article by Yuri Avneri. And Yuri Avneri is a person for whom I have great respect. He's an Israeli intellectual, a peace activist. He used to be a Knesset member. He used to be a publisher. He used to be a fighter in 48 for the Israeli War of Independence. Today's article, which I circulated for Yuri Avneri, is titled, We Have Blood on Our Hands. And uh, he is talking about the issue that many Israelis in official circles we're not happy on the release of Palestinian prisoners being demanded by our side because some of them have Israeli Jewish blood on their hands. 
Now, I remember, sir, and I'm glasnostically transparent with you. A year ago, I was talking in New York to a very privileged audience from the Israeli Israel Policy Forum, an American Jewish institution. And I remember saying that we have over 9,000 Palestinian political prisoners. Today, it's over 10,000, by the way. Which means that every city, village, refugee camp, every extended family has more than one behind bars. And I've always been lobbying the Israelis, release en masse Palestinian political prisoners. You create a positive, favorable shock, psychological shock, because every city, family, refugee camp will get their returnees. The Israelis respond, oh, some of them have blood on their hands. But a peace process is a process of reconciliation. And I responded by saying, if we were to apply the same criteria, I might have difficulties tomorrow finding an Israeli to talk to. And this is the argument being made by Yuri Avneri, by saying, hey, let's not play angels. We were two societies at war. We have killed Palestinians. They have killed Israelis. It's the past. And today, in the release of prisoners, that should not be a criteria. So I believe there should be a package, sir, around the release of the soldier and Palestinian political prisoners. It will improve the political environment. But bear in mind, whenever Fatah and Hamas agree on something, I think they have the capacity to ensure the disciplined adherence of everybody else. But one should help them. <laughs> you cannot have a ceasefire with the Gaza Strip and stop the rockets while Israel is escalating the policy of assassination and arrest in the West Bank. My friend, we are having two killed every day in the West Bank and over 10 every day being arrested. The Israelis say these are ticking bombs. I don't believe this theory that they are ticking bombs on the verge of undertaking a military operation. I believe some of it is revenge, a punitive, etc., and not a preemptive one. So I believe the Israelis should stop their policy of provocation, for example, against Islamic Jihad in the West Bank. The result is that the precarious ceasefire with Gaza collapses. So it needs to be comprehensive. This will be the last question. My name is Dini, I'm an Israeli too. You're most uh, welcome. Uh, my, ask, my question is more about the strategic and less about the vision because I do believe that most Israelis and most Palestinians have the same vision of living together. You mentioned the Hamas uh, willing to go to a ceasefire. I didn't hear a peace process. And we also mentioned that the Israelis are divided and we know that about how much they're willing to withdraw, if ever. My question is, what would you suggest? Should we go, as two countries, to a peace process, or should we go to ceasefire for X years and build trust again and try to forget all the atrocities mm. we have caused each other? No, ma'am, I believe that Hamas is ready for a ceasefire now and a peace process leading to a two-state solution, and I would like to test them up to that extent. And I want to invite the Israeli interlocutors we have in this room. And by the way, thank you for the three of you or the four of you who made very positive inputs into our discussion. I would like you to know, my friends, how we perceive the Israeli political establishment and the Israeli political parties. I'm known as the enfant terrible of the Palestinian movement. And in many seminars with prominent Israeli interlocutors, some of them invited, as I was invited by the famous Herbert Kelman, who has done for the peace process much more than everybody thinks he did. Uh, I am known to have said to Israeli interlocutors, it's labor, Israeli labor party, that made Palestine unlivable to us Palestinians. What Likud usually does is making Israel unlivable to many Jews. So just for you to tell you, that my allergy is not only to Avigdor Lieberman, who wants the expulsion and the ethnic cleansing, etc., and he would make Jean-Marie Le Pen look like a choir boy in comparison. <laughs> my allergy or my, uh, or my uh, in, a, in a way, uh, indignation is not only for Likud, it goes up to labor, because it was labor that is guilty of the ethnic cleansing of 48, labor that was guilty of the last of the colonial wars of 56, labor that took the initiative for 67, labor that started the illegal settlement building. All this was labor, labor, labor. Yet we are ready, my friend, since 73, 74, to make peace with the Israeli state and the Israeli society. 
And I always say, independently of whoever you elect as your political leadership, and I promise that our conditions for peace will remain now flexible and no more elasticity and no more concession. We are ready to negotiate with whoever the Israelis send to us as legitimate negotiators. We are ready to make peace with the Israeli state and the Israeli society. And I told you, glasnostically, transparently, my opinion of three major political uh, parties in Israeli politics. As I told you, I don't think that labor are the good guys. No. They are the ones that made Palestine unlivable to us Palestinians. Yet we are ready for peace. So I can understand that there is reluctance uh, and in, uh, indifference or hostility or suspicion in Israeli society towards Hamas. We, we have to learn to live with you. For example, and that might be my final point. Often people speak about fundamentalism, the intrusion of religion in politics, and single out only Islamic fundamentalism. And my response always is to say the following. In our Middle East, the intrusion of religion in politics, we have witnessed three waves. The first was Jewish fundamentalism. Then in the middle of the 70s, there was an attempt at Christian fundamentalism in Lebanon, but that was the weakest for numerical sociological factors. And the third wave of fundamentalism was the Islamic wave with the Khomeini revolution of 79 onwards. So whoever wants to study this phenomenon of religion and politics has to study it, and it's also chronological, and not single out only one. And uh, I mentioned Christian fundamentalism in Lebanon, which was the weakest, but in the Middle East today, we are suffering from American Christian fundamentalism. And I, as a Palestinian Christian, I feel extremely embarrassed, and I will answer by saying that I had once the pleasure on C-SPAN to respond to, to Pat Robertson by saying, Pat Robertson, each time I hear you, I need to defend and proclaim the innocence of God. Thank you all for coming. Have a safe trip home. <laughs>